today about is the whole world of species rhododendrons. Species rhododendrons occur in the Northern hemisphere around the globe um, from subtropical to alpine. So there are over a thousand species of rhododendrons and mostly um, we only see the hybrids because we love those flowers. But we have to look at plants um, 12 months of the year and species bring all kinds of exciting characteristics to the plants as well as flowers. So I'm gonna show you a whole bunch of um, species uh, pictures here, none of which involve any flowers. Um, R.G. Peplum is a, in bloom right now. It's a nice bright red. Ultimately, it's a, a small tree. Our 40-year-old plants are maybe 10, 12 feet high. Um, and because they're more tree-like, you've got lots of room to plant all kinds of other plants around them. They don't take up a, much space at all in terms of the ground, but they provide wonderful um, early flowers and lots of interesting characteristics. Those hairs are not prickly. They're very soft. You can pet it and it uh, appreciates it. Pachysanthem is a plant from Taiwan and incredibly frosty foliage keeps that look year round. R.G. Peplum, new growth. Notice all the red, those little red strips you see are leaf bracts and they first show up when the foliage opens. The foliage is kind of bronzy, turns green, the leaf bracts fall off, but there's always something interesting about these species. Uh, my favorite time of year really is new growth rather than bloom because the growth is so distinctive. We're gonna see more of Arizelum, but it's a plant whose flowers start pink, fade to yellow, finish white. And since all the buds don't open at the same time, you often have a plant with three different colored flowers on it. And rhododendron um, auriculatum actually blooms in August or July. It's white, it's fragrant, that's its new growth. And there are those red leaf bracts once again. Barovia is kind of an elegant um, mound, maybe five, six feet in 10 years, those glossy green leaves, again with some frosting on the top. And the underneath on Barovia is a wonderful felty orange. So it's really kind of fun. We're still finding new species even after 150 years of Western exploration. Um, Chao Jensi is from China and was introduced about 1999 or so. Um, so we really have only had it in the West for the last couple of years. But again, some maroon new growth, beautiful rounded leaves and soft pink flowers. Flinky eye, these are not diseases on these leaves. <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while, somebody says, what's wrong with that plant? Um, but the answer is no, Mother Nature has got all kinds of protective coatings and all kinds of um, other characteristics that just make these things interesting year round. Lupinense just finished blooming. The new growth now will be this wonderful orange um, bronze, and it will last for a couple of weeks, then the foliage will turn green. But again, look at all those little hairs around there. Here's a flower bud on Nivium. Uh, just looks like a little maybe pine cone sitting there. Um, very distinctive. You know when you're going to have a, a bloom on Nivium. Beautiful purple. Or Fortunae has these wonderful purple petioles on some forms. And uh, again, a, a fragrant pink, bigger plant. This is actually the father of the Loderi series. Maybe you are familiar with Loderi King George or Loderi Venus, um, plants, hybrids with big um, showy flowers, but here's dad. Melodum has this beautiful orange underneath so that when the wind blows, the leaves kind of rustle, all of a sudden you're looking at these striking orange uh, undersides and bright red in bloom again right now. A lot of the species are bloom um, earlier than the hybrids. The a hybrid, by the way, is taking any two different rhodes times each other. So we grow from seed, which means that I've already 
had two different melodums bloom. And before the flower ever opens, I strip the um, pretty red parts off of that flower and save the pistil and then bring pollen from another melotum and put the pollen on the, the first melotum. And you can work the cross both ways. And what I really like to do is, is use um, sister seedlings because it's a way, what we're really doing is mixing genes. Hybrids are all cookie cutters of each other. Genetically, they're exactly the same. Whereas the, in the species, we really want to keep as much genetic material as we can. And so um, nature doesn't really like selfing. And rather than self, we use two melodums uh, times each other. And so we end up with, often end up with a funny situation where my father is my mother's sister. <laughs> Pseudochrysanthemum is from Taiwan and uh, comes in lots of different forms. Some, some species are very uniform and others have a great deal of variation. Mother Nature doesn't use cookie cutters. And so um, Pseudochrysanthemum is one of those where you can have really dwarf forms, taller forms, frosty forms, glossy forms, and they're all Pseudochrysanthemum growing in the mountains of, of Taiwan. So part of the fun of doing all this is getting to travel. So I've done mm, about five trips to China, one to Tibet, one to Arunachal Pradesh, one to Japan. So in 97, I had an opportunity to go to Tibet when we went there by starting out from Kathmandu and we took off did about three circles around before we began to head north because we needed a little elevation to get around Mount Everest, but there were the Himalayas spread out before us. It was just an incredible sight. And so as we're driving through Tibet, here by the side of the road is Rhododendron principus um, all by itself. This was a May trip and um, we got to see some of these roadies out in the, in the wild. So roadies, um, like I say, are northern hemisphere around the globe, which means there are roadies in Switzerland, in Turkey, in Siberia, Alaska, West Coast, um, East Coast of the U.S., uh, Japan, China, Burma. Uh, gosh, the list just goes on and on and on. And uh, this is probably the pinkest form of Primula florum that any of us had ever seen. And unfortunately, it being a spring trip, we were unable to find any seed of that, but it would be really wonderful to be able to introduce that to our gardens. Part of the wonderful thing that happened on this trip is that we got to prove out a species. There were about six plants of Lanatoides in Scotland and the collector's notes from uh, George Forrest uh, simply noted the location as the Rong Chu Valley, which is sort of like saying it's in California, um, but we, headed for the Rongshu Valley, and we really lucked out because we proved the existence. And this is what we found. And you could hardly tell that those are even rhododendrons. We walked among the trunks. They were about 10 to 15 feet tall, obviously very, very ancient. And um, we actually had to climb a few of these to get up into the flowers, and we were able to find seed and, and bring it back. We also decided to botanize a pass that had really never been done by Westerners. This is the dashing law. And if you look at the, in the very left corner of the screen, you see that little red flower sticking its head up. Um, that, oops, wrong way. That was for SDI repens. There's a whole hillside of it. It was really quite spectacular. The snow had just melted out. We had to cross a couple avalanche fields to get there. Uh, but we, we, we did it. And um, you know that roads are supposed to have good drainage. Well, here is Forestii repens and Campylo carpum, the yellow one, blooming in a fast running little stream. And the plants are obviously doing well right in the middle of the stream, but mostly it's because that was snow melt. It would disappear pretty quickly. And the growing season is very, very short. We're probably up around 12 to 13,000 feet here. Um, and uh, it was, we all were amazed at roadies growing in the middle of a stream. 
This is what for SDI repens looks like. A little tricky to grow, but um, a fine little rock garden plant. These were our porters that took us into that trip. We, we, we were supposed to spend three days, three nights out, um, a day into base camp, a day up on the pass, and a day getting out. And um, while we were at the top looking at those beautiful Forestii references, um, half our group had gone back because of those avalanches, and the Red Army showed up and um, basically beat up our Tibetan drivers and tried to arrest the, the group that was down in base camp. And they said, oh, but that's only half of us. The other half of us are up on the pass. Don't, don't forget them. Be sure you get them too. So the Red Army decided they didn't really want to chase us. They decided that we should just report to the Army barracks in Bumi the next day, where the general came out to meet us and told us we were all under arrest um, mm -hmm. because we didn't have permits to be there. So we said, well, yes, we do have permits. The permits we had were actually written by his boss. And he said, oh, show me, show me the permits. And he studied them for a bit and he said, ah, I see the problem. These permits were written in Lhasa and permits written in Lhasa don't count out here. So uh, I think I'll instead arrest you as spies because you're taking pictures of the undersides of our bridges because the, your uh, satellites can't see under the bridges and you want to know what's under there. So um, give me your, your camera and your film. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all looked at each other and said, no, we're not going to do that. And he looked at us and said, okay, <laughs> which is when I finally decided we were not about to be hauled off to jail. We were about to be fleeced for a whole lot of money, <laughs> which is what happened. Our Tibetan guide would never quite tell us um, how much he had to pay to get us out of Hawk. But at any rate, on we went, got tossed out of there. And the sad part was we didn't get to do another pass that also had never been botanized by Westerners. So on we went, we're up about 14,000 feet here and it looks very barren out there, but actually all the local people are moving their yak herds up to this valley for summer pasture. And that place is just crawling with yaks and um, yak herders. But whole hillsides of rhododendron Diwali up there and usually Nivali is very blue, and these were um, much pinker than usual. Once again, no seed. That's the problem with spring trips. You have to either decide you want flowers or you want seed, but it's very difficult to get both unless you can stay for six months. With the, um, uh, these trips always end up being only a third botanical. They're a third cultural, a third political, and I say a third spiritual as well. So this was the monastery at um, Shiutiga. And um, Joseph Rock had, um, I'm sorry, Kingdon Ward had stayed here back in the 20s. And um, one of the old monks remembered that as a boy, he had seen a Westerner. But um, he was very happy to show us the monastery. And there really were only two of them there. Um, there are no middle-aged monks in Tibet. They're either dead or in India. Um, and the government says, oh yeah, we respect the minorities and we let them have their superstitions, but they only let them have two monks as opposed to what had been a rather large monastery there. And what was left was the bombed out buildings from the war in the 50s when uh, China invaded Tibet. This is the library. Inside each of those boxes is a uh, carved wooden block with <laughs> Buddhist scripture verses on it. And depending on the verse you want, you will haul out the wood block, ink it up, and print you a copy of that Buddhist scripture. And you see them all over the place. Tibet is far and away the most uh, um, devout place I've ever seen. The Buddhism is just incredibly ingrained in the people. Um, and uh, they hold it very, very dear. The Mani stone, where um, the one young monk was carving these stones in a, in a soft shale. And I stopped to admire one and um, he showed it to me. And then he promptly took it and threw it on the ground and smashed it into lots of pieces, just, just to remind me that nothing is permanent. This is in China. There's attempts to revive um, the 
the old monasteries, uh, they're, they're being redone. Um, you can see all the restoration in progress. And um, Yuli is really part, was part of Tibet until the government chopped it off and put it into Sichuan. So it's really hard to tell where Tibet starts and, and stops. Here are the prayer flags around the monastery. And this is the entrance to Muli territory. In 2013, um, we had no trouble getting in. In 2015, they weren't about to let us in. And finally, our Chinese host said, no, they're not journalists. They're not going to write about how you treat the Tibetans. Um, they're just here to see the mountains and the monasteries. And I'm sure he slipped them a few yuan. And then they said, OK, go into town, report to the local police station, and pick up a monitor who will be with you at all times. So we pulled into the local police station. I'm sure our host again slipped them a few more yuan and said, you know, you're going to be very bored with this out there. We're just looking at mountains and monasteries. Why don't you just stay here in the office and we'll call in on the cell phone? And he said, fine, I'll, I'll, I, I can do that. So we didn't have the monitor, but all of a sudden the police cars began patrolling um, these dirt roads out in the middle of nowhere. And there, you know, there goes a patrol car. And five minutes later, there goes another patrol car. This is our driver, Mr. Liu, who promised us that he would show us that he was the Buddha. And when we got to this particular pavilion, I think he might be right. That's a Sino Grandi leaf in the hand. Uh, and a spruce tree behind where they've been nicking at the bark in order to get kindling. Now, this is the largest rhododendron I've ever seen. That trunk on the left side of the picture is literally eight feet in diameter. It is a protestum, and we know it's eight feet because we took our belts off, measured the circumference and belt lengths, and then somebody produced a meter stick and we calibrated our belts. And he was old calculator day, so he's punching the numbers. And he says, oh, made a mistake. I got to start over. No, it really is eight feet in diameter. It was about 110 feet tall and probably three, 400 years old. You, you could only guess. In the old days, we got to do pack trains. There's the pony man carrying all our stuff. You can imagine what your bag looks like after a day on the back of that pony banging on the rocks and the what have you, but uh, it all seemed to work. The roadies are under intense pressure from uh, development, from this is illegal logging. Um, China is very, very cut over. They tell me there's virgin forest, but I've never seen a square meter of it. Um, and um, this was a illegal logging uh, operation that drew attention because some of those cabins slid down the mountain with the loggers inside and uh, they got shut down, but not before they just denuded that whole hillside, which then of course erodes and falls into the nearest river. There are a few chunks left. Here's the temperate rainforest. Um, staying with the rangers, two rangers for an area about the size of Connecticut. And they said, if we can stop that illegal logging, that will be a major accomplishment. That's really all they were trying to do. The hillside was covered with nuttalai, a beautiful fragrant rhododendron, uh, kind of tender, but it works wonderfully well as a container plant and really very spectacular. And the Yunnan countryside again is really um, part of more Tibetan than it is anything else. There's the woman bringing her barley little poetry as we're walking along um, this rock had this inscription by the stream so I asked my favorite Chinese host Mr. Wang uh, what it said the moonlight is very beautiful here and the stream always has water and it isn't all roadies here's a Paris just growing out there and of course Arasima I've never met an Arasima that I didn't like Cypripediums Yunnan is just a treasure of, of all kinds of flora. There's that Sino Grandi that I had the leaf of. Pre-stance, we, we really were hoping to see it. And uh, uh, I, we kind of break up when we head into the woods. And uh, my two companions were talking about a plant and I was kind of bored. So I moved on and I found the pre-stance. It was kind of fun. Another one that we introduced is Gongshanensi. Um, 
and we're able to get seed of this, and it's growing at Chimicum Woods. Unfortunately, it likes to start its growth in January and flowers in January. Uh, but I have one version of it that has stood up um, since 2000 and gone through all our winters, it was untouched last winter. It's never bloomed for me yet, but it's hardy compared to its sisters. So it really pays to grow from seed because you get um, a chance for that genetic variation. And lo and behold, one of those plants has proven hardy. Some rhodes are just epiphytes. This guy's growing on a tree. You won't find it ever growing in the ground. You might find it growing on boulders, but um, beautiful little yellow also in bloom right now. We've got a number of things. And that's me climbing the rock face to try and get it. When I got up there, I decided that I didn't want to let go of either hand or move either foot, sort of hanging on for dear life to that cliff. So I ended up taking the branch in my teeth and bringing the seed pods to my fingers and managed to um, use two fingers to pick the pods, transfer the pods to my teeth and come back down. But you can see how barren some of those hillsides are, mostly because it's been logged over. Um, there, that should be full forest and that's, that's what's left. There's that Arizelum in bloom toward the end because they're white. We saw Dichroanthem scyphocalyx up there. And this is Rhododendron hyleum. There's a whole forest of 30 to 60 foot trees uh, with a beautiful gray smooth bark. I actually got Mr. Wang to climb one of those and pick some seed for me. And of course it rains, 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 rains. So there we are, camped out. And there's the mystery plant that those two were talking about while I decided to go find the pre-sants. And some of the fun is just, there's the zip line across the Salween River. The Salween is about four times the size of the Mississippi at flood stage. And uh, it was quite a thrill to take the zip line over and, and back. Uh, let's see, what was it? It was um, 10 yuan, which was a dollar and a quarter in those days. To see them in the fog, just the red globes would shine through. Peter Cox, the very famous Scotsman, um, who was also in that other picture with with uh, um, pre, with the um, tall tall boy, little tiny Campylogynum, and um, the, the, we stumbled across a museum uh, of World War II remains where. The Chinese were, this was the, the flying tigers going over the hump. And um, they have preserved this plane that didn't make it. Um, and the, just the most vitriolic um, anti-Japanese stuff in that museum it was unbelievable how deep that, that wound is and how pleased they were that, that um, we showed up and, and uh, rescued them. This, if you haven't got Gore-Tex, Trachycarpus will do. It's the dried fronds of a, a, a plant that grows wild in Yunnan. And this guy's coming in from the field in the rain wearing his Trachycarpus raincoat. Occasionally you get these picturesque chances where um, you get beautiful flowers spread with the horses. And then here's Mr. Wang. Um, we all lined up for, for um, the group photograph and couldn't I couldn't resist saving my camera and taking a picture of Mr. Wang taking all of the pictures of the cameras. <laughs> Another trip we got to go into the Dulong, a river that had an area that had never been explored by Western um, people. The Chinese had kept Westerners out for 50 years and they finally put a new road in. We were some of the first to get to use it and um, Pretty, pretty exciting. Um, you wouldn't want to slip. Uh, that's Peter Wharton, um, now deceased, of um, University of British Columbia uh, fame. And of course, the leeches. Um, Don forgot to check his boots and socks, paid the, paid the price. But the real attraction were the older ladies in the Dulong, all of whom were tattooed because the Dulong people were kind of the transportation system between Tibet and China. And they're a very small stature people, 
the Tibetans would raid the villages periodically and take off the young girls, the 13 year olds, and take them as slaves um, for all kinds of purposes. And so to fight back, the Dulong tribe uh, tattooed the faces. It's one of my favorite pictures because here's grandma with her two grandkids hanging on her. They, they were teasing and having a great old time. And uh, obviously she's the only grandmother they ever knew. And that's the way grandmothers come. Little epiphytic rhododendron, mananthum. You see some traditional dress left. Notice the men are not in traditional dress, but some of the women still do it. And here is the um, largest hydroelectric dam. that We had to drive around the reservoir and it took us all day just to get to the other side of that thing. It was pretty, pretty incredible. They were, people remember Joseph Rock uh, because he befriended the people, did lots of good medical things with them. And they were just very pleased. They, they considered it a real honor that, that uh, they had Joseph Rock uh, helping them back in the early 1900s. And here's the memorial. Unfortunately, um, China's a mess. Here's the smog in Chengdu. That smog lasted for two days. We thought we'd get out of it, and we really didn't. China's covered with new freeways, all of which are level. The way you build a freeway in China is that you um, drill a hole in the mountain that's in your way, and then you, when you come out the other side, you build these incredibly high platforms just to keep the freeway flat. Um, so you can zip right along. You never slow down for an uphill grade. But the problem is, how do you build access roads to this freeway? Because when you're a thousand feet above the valley, when you come out of that tunnel, you need an access road to get to the village down below. And you need maybe 20 acres to do that because you've got to snake a road up. And they just destroy everything in its path as, as they do it. Funny things, notice the Nike swoosh and the cell phone on this monk who is heading home after his day as a monk. Um, it's not like we usually think of as monks. They're, they're often married, they have girlfriends. Um, they, they head home and uh, come back tomorrow to continue being the monk. China's trying to do some national parks. So uh, they, they are trying to develop uh, a homegrown tourist industry. So here's a rhododendron spiroblastum, that big trunk, um, paved right over with it on its root system with that uh, cement sidewalk inlaid with um, the, the rock. And there's a um, reflecting pond that they've built next to this Roxianum. It was a small little stream, but they built a little rock dam at the end and flooded the base because you want to see the rhododendron in a reflecting pond. There's the Roxianum. And unfortunately, um, it's really um, not, um, <laughs> it's not very good for the rhododendron because rhododendrons do not like to sit in water year round. This is, somebody said there was a panda in those hills. And so this little group of houses decided that they were gonna become a great tourist destination. There's the billboard advertising the new panda reserve, which didn't really exist yet. A mix of the old and the new. Here's the, the butcher shop in the, the town, right next to the freezers to put your meat in. Uh, so the old ways are probably dying out. The Chinese government really wants people in cities and wants them out of the mountains. They make life tough for them. So here's the, the toll gate. And here's the, um, the, the car carrier. There's 21 new vehicles on that truck. The biggest of one of which was this one. How you ever made a turn with that thing, I have no idea, but um, I imagine you never take it off the freeway. And uh, since it's flat, the thing can zip along quite fast. We did manage to get one overnight trip. We started out at the old Meow Village. We we're gonna camp out one night. So we're stocking up for the night's groceries. And there's the local people, women who've brought in their produce. I'm not sure quite how it works, whether that's a collective or each one brought their own produce. Um, at any rate, that's our Chinese host back there in the yellow raincoat buying some veggies. 
And we came out at the new Meow Village. The new Meow Village is strictly phony. This is Disneyland, um, the Wild West in Disneyland. There's not one Meow person in that picture. Those are all Han Chinese who've been told they should go west and, and have a vacation. And so they think they're seeing um, the, the way the Meow people live. And um, this, is, this is just plain phony. Lots of stuff for sale, of course. In the meantime, two thirds of the Meow people have been shipped off to the apartments in the city where they don't get residency permit, which means they don't get health care and their children have to um, go back to the village for school because they're not entitled to, to enroll in the local schools. Let's get back to roadies. So this is what Barbatum will look like after 30 years. This is in our garden. Uh, beautiful, beautiful trunk. Nice bright red flowers right now. There's that Lanatoides, the seed of which came from Tibet in the garden. Beautiful blue foliage on Campanulatum subspecies originosum. You can tell I like RG peplum. Here it is again. Some erosum has this as the new growth, very chocolatey, hairy. There are the Gongshanensi seedlings that uh, came um, also from Yunnan. Degronium hondoensi from um, Japan. Look at the indumentum on that Barovii. Just really quite nice. Sincuensi, that one that I was hanging onto the cliff for, there's its seed pod. So when these things set seed, um, you uh, have another focal point. Um, you know what your roadies look like when you don't deadhead them and you have all those spent flowers and then you develop all these big pods. Well, Sincuensi has very discreet little um, round little pods that are rather interesting. Here's the new growth on strigillosum. That's just the way it starts. Sorry, NC, a nice little pink, but again, frosty foliage the year round. Those are not flower buds, they're just leaf buds. Gonna develop six branches as each of those elongates. The whole group of Japanese deciduous azaleas that we very rarely see and um, I'd love to be able to introduce these because they're quite distinctive. They have that rhombic leaf shape, nice fall color. That hyleum, the tree that Mr. Wang climbed for me, there it is growing at Chimicum Woods. It's now about six feet tall, um, has a long ways to go before it's that 30 foot tree. Uh, maybe a couple generations from now, I hope it's still there and somebody can climb it. Just Leaf buds on pre stance. William Zianum, wonderful little moundy thing, maybe three by three at, at most, four by four if you're lucky, but it has, uh, has these beautiful new bronze, new growth. It will turn green, just a good doer. Magniflorum too has that beautiful red new growth. Lasts for a couple of weeks, then it turns green. Sycotensi, the leaves have a wonderful fragrance. On a summer day, um, you can, if you're around a clump of these, you can just smell the tangy, uh, piney smell in the air that's coming from the leaves on this. This is from Siberia, so it's, it's hardy. Quinquifolium is one of those Japanese azaleas. Some forms have that beautiful red outline on the leaf. And that's not, not a disease, it's just a coating on the new growth of Sino Grandi. It will slowly flake off, peel off, um, but um, it's, as the new growth expands, there it is. And so again, a point of interest well beyond the bloom season. Another form of Pachysanthum that we saw before. And so the siren song sings on. We were stuck at the top of a 16,000 foot pass in Tibet because a logging truck had bogged down in the mud in the one lane road and our drivers were busy constructing a, a detour around it. And um, all of a sudden, this woman just came out of nowhere. Um, there's, there's nothing in front of her that's any different than what's behind her. Where she came from, <clears throat> I have no idea, but um, it's just always st struck me as, uh, 
that siren song that, that drives on and on and on. 